are you, my dear? If you look at how I am, I'm so glad you came. Um, Miss Gorgie, we work in our jobs in order to earn enough money to live and do the things we want to do. Is there a deeper significance to what we work at and what guidelines should we use when we are looking for a job? You work to earn your living. What more do you want? Aren't you lucky that you're working to earn a living? So otherwise, you'd just be lazing around at home and your mind will just be in a turmoil, just worrying, 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 and it'll be turning around and round and round and cause you far more greater emotional harm. The work itself is a therapy for the mind. And when a person does not indulge in work, then the mind can become very emotional and very upset. So, any kind of work is good. For example, if I'm put in a position to go and sweep streets, I will not feel ashamed. I might have so many degrees behind my name, but sweeping streets I will not feel ashamed because any honest work that provides you with an honest living is noble. So one should never bother with what kind of work one is doing. Now, that does not mean that you must have no ambition. See, if I am a street sweeper, I will work hard and try and become the supervisor of street sweepers. And that's how I will increase my position and my pay. Because I might need more money as the family grows. I'm referring to young people now. And there's one secret of work. As the Gita says, and I've spoken about this before, that you work for the sake of work and not for the fruits thereof. People do the reverse. They first think of the fruits and then they think of the work. You apply for a job and most of the times, and in my organizations, I was in very big businesses before I chucked up everything and took on the life of a mendicant, a beggar, to teach, to perform my mission in the world. And as soon as a person would ask me, before even having a proper discussion, what is a job going to pay, I show him the door. Because it means only one thing, that he is not interested in work. He's interested in pay. And people like Charles, who's a big businessman, will bear me out. Well, that happens, because he employs a lot of people as well. So, when we develop the idea to work for the sake of work, the benefits come by themselves. The usual analogy I use is this, that if you are in a job, you do not every day say to yourself or think the whole day, paycheck, 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 paycheck. No, you don't. You just do your work, and you do it well, and at the end of the month your paycheck comes automatically. So the fruits come. And the less you worry about the fruits of your work, the more fruit will there be. When you plant a tree, you are not going to say, Oh, I want 2,000 apples to grow on this tree. No. You plant the tree, you nurture it, you water it, you fertilize it, and you leave it to the powers that be to produce as much fruit as possible. And if you have been really loving to the plant or the tree and given it much love, the regular watering, regular manuring, and etc. that goes with planting, then you will find that your tree will bloom much, much better. And there will be more fruit, more apples on the tree. Mind you, the trouble with the world began with the fig tree, especially when the leaf fell off. So, the secret is very simple. Work for the sake of work. And if you are not happy with the job, 
I can tell you this, that 99% of the world's population are not happy with their jobs. So, it is not the job that bothers you, but your mental attitude towards the job that bothers you. So it means that you are bothering yourself and not the job. There should be no likes or dislikes in your work. If you qualify as a music teacher, try and find a job as a music teacher. If you're qualified as a carpenter, try and find a job as a carpenter. And most people, of course, always want the top positions. They never think, let me start at the bottom. If I show my work, I prove myself, the promotions will come quick and fast. Many people reach a saturation point where they reach the top position in a job and then they find themselves frustrated because they've reached the top now and they can do no more. So that is a very silly assumption. If I have a business that does selling and my turnover is a million pound a month, I can work harder and make my turnover two million pound. It can be done. It depends upon your determination. The success in anything in life, apart from including work, is to have a burning desire. The burning desire backed with self-confidence in yourself that I can do it. There's no such thing as impossible. And I always say that if you put an apostrophe between impossible, between the I and the M, then it would be I'm possible. The apostrophe between the M and the P rather. I am possible or whatever. My English is so poor. No, it is after the I. I am possible. Now, once you affirm to yourself that I am possible, then nothing can become impossible. Now you want to improve your position. You can. You have the burning desire. You have the perseverance. You've got to persevere. You've got to make effort. For no one else is going to make that effort for you. You've got to make the effort yourself. And with that burning desire in you, where night and day you visualize your aim. Any young man sitting here, or a woman, if they decide now that in five years' time I will have one million points in my bank, he will definitely have it. A burning desire, perseverance, determination, and an aim, a goal. You have the goal and you have the plan. Many a multi-millionaire started with absolutely nothing. And I can quote you so many cases. J.P. Morgan owned the world's greatest steel empire. Henry Ford of the motor cars. He started with repairing bicycles. And perhaps in your country you have such men also. But there's one mistake they've done, all those multi-millionaires that had the determination and the will and the perseverance and the effort. There's only one mistake they made. And that is why they are so unhappy. Their determination was only for wealth, for money, and they made money their god. But that does not mean that a person must remain poor. Become rich. If you have a small Volkswagen motor car, there's nothing wrong in you driving a Rolls Royce. But at the same time, have in your mind that the Rolls Royce or the Volkswagen is none different. Because they both take me from point A to point B, and that's all I need. To reach from point A to point B. So what are you looking for? In one thing that Rolls Royce, you're looking for prestige, symbol status. Ah, Rolls Royce. And you develop such a big ego 
So that while you're driving, or your chauffeur is driving, you wouldn't look around out of the windows, even if your friends are passing. The real intimate friends that were poor like you, and you don't even look at them. So what, when a person achieves something, be it in any field, be it in my field, or the field of big business, or anything, one must develop the quality of humility. And that is a great asset. Be humble. And if you are humble, if you have humility, then all the other virtues attract themselves to humility. You become truthful, you become kind, you become compassionate, you develop sympathy towards those that suffer, and all these virtues get so well added to you. And when these virtues are there, that, in spite of all the wealth, will make you happy. Most wealthy people are not happy because they have not developed their, their virtues. And funny enough, as you know, that is only when you're in trouble you pray to God. Oh God, give me this and give me that and give me a good job and give me this. Aren't you begging? And God does not like beggars. He does not like beggars. He does not want you to beg from him or to do business with him. But give me a nice job, God, and I will say Hail Mary's a million times. No, you don't need that. If your mind is brought steady through your spiritual practices, you can attract anything you like. I'm talking of personal experiences. Every word I speak in every satsang, and I've done thousands of satsang, all come from not book knowledge, but personal knowledge and personal experience. So the quality lies within us to attract. If you want to attract a better job, make yourself conducive to attract that better job. God does not give you what you want. He gives you what you need according to your state of evolution and your state of mind. Yeah. I tell you how thought works, and Charles is with me, will bear me out. It's a funny little story, really. I regard it to be funny. We were going down these long passages of Madrid Airport, and you know you have those little start on which you tie your suitcase, what do you call them, cart, trolley, yes. And in front of us, you know, I can't carry any heavy things, I can't exert because of the heart condition, and because of the sugar, the body is not strong, it's weak. So I was telling you, I was to an old man, you know, with a bag on that trolley. So I was telling Charles, I said, you know, Charles, I must really make a plan of getting a trolley like this because you're know, carrying the baggages and fishes at international airports, you've got to walk miles. I mean, all of you that have been to Heathrow and big international airports would know that. Okay, I was just telling Charles that, and he will bear me out. So we arrive at Madrid Airport on, for the Spanish cross, and you have to stand at the Rondavel thing that brings your baggage. And would you believe this? that a trolley, a brand new one, the price tag was still on it, was tied tightly to my suitcase. Where it came from, I don't know. And like this, I could give you a million instances where things happen. So if you have a concentrated mind, this afternoon, this whole afternoon, I was going through the forms, the progress forms of people, and I remember someone said they don't do the practice of tratak. I can't remember who it was. Right. So, tratak is very, very important. Tratak is a practice, you know, the candle practice. Right. Tratak is a practice where without concentrating, and just focusing your attention to the candle, 
your mind automatically becomes concentrated without any effort. And of course many people see wonderful scenes and visions and things like that, but that's besides the point. They are not so important. If you see it, good, enjoy it. If not, it's still okay. So when the mind becomes concentrated through the constant practice of pratik, your thought forces become more powerful. You see, that is what it is aimed at. When your thought forces become more powerful, your mantra practice becomes more powerful. It's all interlinked with each other. When that becomes more powerful, your Guru Shakti practice becomes more powerful. Because with a concentrated mind, with a one-pointed mind, you attract that grace which helps you, which gives you strength to face any problem in life. Good. Now, you want to improve your position and you want a job. That job is not going to fall on your lap. That is for sure. Things might fall on my lap, perhaps. That's besides the point, like this trolley. I'll give you another example. After doing the course in England, I have to go to Canada. And I did not have a Canadian visa. Now, the Canadian embassy has one rule. That they just do not grant you a visa. You've got to appear there in person. And you get taken into a office and they interview you. What's your reasons for going? How many times were you there? Who are you going to? What's your address? All kinds of questions. They ask you. It takes you half an hour. It's a room full of people sitting there. We even heard you know, uh, some Dr. Mason being called up for an interview and others. We sat there for 15 minutes, myself and Charles. Charles took me there. And then my name was called. And this lady comes up to me. She had the passport open. Sir, here's your visa for Canada. Enjoy your trip. No interview, nothing. I just handed the passport to the clerk, and the clerk took it into the offices. This Charles that will bear that out. Thought force can be used in a very constructive, powerful way. And I've read those forms. I was studying them, the progress forms, where there were a few that said, I haven't got a job, I can't find a job. That is nonsense. There are millions of people in the world that can find jobs. Why can't you? There's nothing wrong with this world. The thing that is wrong is with you. Subconsciously, you are not desiring a job. Your conscious mind says, oh, I must have a job. I must find a job. But subconsciously, it says, no, nah, you want to be lazy. The method there, apart from your spiritual practices, is affirmation. Every morning you get up, and every night you go to sleep, you affirm to yourself that I am going to find a job today. I am going to find a job today. And I am going to find a bloody job today. And no power on earth is going to stop me from finding a job. And if you have that determination, you will. When you go for an interview for the job, and you wait in the waiting room to see the personnel manager or the boss or whoever, do a few minutes of Guru Shakti, calm yourself, and walk in there with conflict. And repeat in your mind the affirmation, you are going to give me a job. Many people have risen to high positions. He went to an employer, asked for a job, and gave his resume of his activities, you know, what he had done before, that thing. And he would say, Sir, these are my qualifications. Start me any way you like. And give me the pay, perhaps, whatever it is, for the position you will give me. And if you prove yourself, You'll get promoted to where you should really be. So there is nothing impossible. I ran away from home when I was 14. I just passed my matriculation and I ran away from home and I wanted to go to university. I was totally broke. 
and not a penny to my name. So I went to a restaurant. So I spoke to the restaurant manager, and I don't know if something about my face. No one can say no to me, since I was a young boy, God's grace. And I spoke to the owner there, and I said, please, sir, I want a job. I don't want any pay. Just give me food. Just one meal a day is enough for me. And I'll do cleaning up, washing dishes, anything you say. And then he gave me the job. We are going to find an employee that's going to work for nothing and eating the leftovers in the evening that the customers did not buy. I did that. But three days later, the council found, because I had no sleeping place, so after the restaurant was closed, I had to sleep on the tables. Put two tables together and sleep on it. And the council found out that you're not allowed for a person to sleep inside a restaurant, you know, because it's supposed to be unhygienic. And I'm the most hygienic person in the world. But still, those are the laws. Fine. So, the owner was very sympathetic to me and explained me the position that I'm sorry, my son, you have to go. Otherwise, I lose my license. So, I had to go. Nowhere to go, no money, no food, hungry. And I sat, this was in Bombay, I sat on Chopati Beach, beautiful beach. If you ever go to Bombay, you will definitely visit the Marine Drive and the Chopati Beach. And I was sitting there, it was late at night. It was dark, not too late. I sat there and I was crying. I want to go to university. I haven't got money. I haven't got a roof over my head. I haven't got food, nothing. And I was sitting there crying. And I said, look, something must happen. I'm just crying to let my emotions out. It's good to cry. It's a very good thing to cry. And the trouble with many men is this, that they don't know how to cry. Cry. Let out the full and that. Yeah. It relieves the mind and the heart. So here, a lady taps me on the shoulder. She says, why are you crying? You're quite a pretty girl. You must have been in her 22, 23, 24, and like that. She says, why are you crying? So I could hardly speak at first because the tears were welling up. And then she sat for a few moments. And after that, I started speaking. And I told her my position in a nutshell. So she says, don't worry, that's all right. Come and live with me. I've got a room. We can stay there. I said, if I haven't got money to pay you, she says, no, don't worry about that now. We can always do that later. Afterwards, I found out that she was a society prostitute. I used to call her Didi, which in Hindi means a sister. She had this gentleman call us. She wasn't one of the street girls, no. She had her gentleman call us, and she used to make a living that way. And my relationship with her was brother and sister. And we could. She paid my fees to go to university. I stayed with her for a year and a half. And I was going to university. Meanwhile, I found my job in film studios. First as a sweeper. Huh? Be ashamed of work. Hmm. First as a studio sweeper. From there, I became friends with everyone. And I became an assistant to the scriptwriter. Here is a director here. You would know all about it. Right. Studio sweeper. Then I became assistant to the director. I became an assistant to the casting director. I became an assistant to the director. I became assistant to the producer. And they all just loved me. I suppose my ways are such. And the salary was very small. And then, of course, I used to meet all the film stars, you know, in the studios. and friends with everyone. And every time I used to say, uh, oh, my God, you know, I haven't got any money. In goes the hand of the person who I'm speaking to, a film star or a producer, and takes out a whole role and puts it in my hand. I said, no, no, I don't need so much. He said, you keep it, you 
What? Because of the thirst of what? That if I want to succeed in life, I can. Determination. At university I was a very brilliant student and all the professors loved me and the senior lecturers and all. I used to write plays for the university, I used to direct them, I used to produce them, I used to compose music for them, for the play, colleagues, and I was very well liked, especially by the girls. My phone would not stop ringing, they used to follow me around. In my younger days I was quite handsome, I'm so ugly now. So, like that, while at university during vacations, nice to go into the Himalayas, and well, the story is a long story, really. But I'm just talking of that determination and the perseverance, how you persevere. That's the point I'm driving at. Fine. So, at the university, the government had commissioned Professor Dave to write a book, to do research rather, you know, on the prostitution problem of Bombay. Because in Bombay, there are 30,000 registered prostitutes. And the government legalized it because India is so, so populated and so much poverty. So the men had to leave their wives at home to come to the city to do work, to find work, to support the families. So the government legalized prostitution, otherwise it could be so many diseases. So Professor Devere was assigned to make researches into this problem. Now I and Professor Devere became very good friends. So one day I thought, wait a minute, I know we're doing these researches because we used to talk about it. You know, and although even at a young age when I was 14, 15, my friends had always been 25 and over. I was much older mentally and physically for my age. And so I introduced him to Didi. They fell in love while we were researching together. Now Didi has this long story behind Didi. When India got partitioned between India and Pakistan, the refugees and, and how in front of her very eyes she hid away how her two little sisters were were murdered by the Muslims, how her mother was raped and killed afterwards. Can you imagine a scene where a man takes a sharp long knife and lifts up a woman's breast by her nipple and slashes it? Imagine that. And her father was killed and all, and so she somehow hid away, although she saw all this hid away and escaped and came to India, no work what to do. So this was the line she took up. Uh, the story is very long. I could write a book about it, which I will one day. All right. So, I used to have plenty of money there in the film studios. I used to get a little salary. I was brilliant in my work at school. When it came to exam times, the students used to sit and swap and study and study. I used to go and sit in the cinema. I never used to swap. Because my principle was this, that at the time when the lecturer is lecturing to you, you must grasp what he is saying at that time. And if you have grasped what he is saying, the major points of what he is saying, then you do not need to slog and slave and study for the exams that are coming. So I used to go and sit in the cinema and enjoy myself. Then of course because of other political reasons and things, I, after I qualified, and spent a lot of time with my guru in between and then for a long period afterwards he ordered me to go to the west and that's how I landed up in South Africa. Now, I had qualified as an accountant but in South Africa I knew no one and a person is not going to entrust their finances and their books to anyone they don't know. So I thought and thought and thought, now let me plan something, how to get clients. So I joined these various organizations, social organizations, business organizations, and all that, and worked. And I would never take a position as a chairman, I would always take a position as the general secretary, because he is the main man. A chairman is just a figurehead. 
there's a general secretary that does all the work. And like that, I started knowing all the people, and a lot of them were business people. Most of them were business people. Even today now, you and I started an institution for the Cape Hindu Cultural Society were one million ron, so that's a South African money. More than a third of the project is completed. I made the community donate, because we had the trustees, and they handled accounts and all that. And a third of the project is finished, and busy on the second stage, and then the third stage. One would be a community hall, where the children can come and play badminton and things, and of course have meetings and social gatherings. The other is a temple for them, and the other is a school, which will be used as a primary school and a nursery school, and many of the rooms will be used for arts, crafts, and what have you, and cultural. The name of the society is the Hindu Cultural Society, and I started this society for them, because I've given it over to younger people to carry on, because I have to travel around overseas so much. Now to come to the point, I befriended all those people by working hard for these societies. And as I started knowing them, they started getting trust in me. So I got one client to do his work. Through him, a recommendation, another client, another client, another client. And my accountancy practice expanded so much that I had to take in two extra partners with a staff of 38. Yeah. My wife couldn't stand the climate of South Africa and neither the laws of South Africa. So we decided to go back to India. And we went back to India. But then after a while, because of other things, other investments and what have you, back to South Africa, and I wanted to start a film business. I'd first bought a cinema in which I lost everything, including my underpants. I tried to find the reason why did I lose in the cinema. It was before TV days. The only contract I had was with Fox, 20th Century Fox, while my opposition had three cinemas, and mine was a small one, three cinemas, and he had all the other contracts, United Artists, MGM, and the works. Right. So I lost a lot of money. And I analyzed the reason why did I lose all this money because the big film distributors held the monopoly. I thought to myself, why can't I start a film company, an importing company, seeing that I've had so much experience working in the film studios. But they require big money for that. I had some money saved from my accountancy practice, but that was not enough. I needed about 20 million. So I got hold of some partners that used to know me very well, whose books I used to do, and I know what they're worth. So I got them interested. And this one client had a chain of cinemas too, so I explained to him that, look, your chain of cinemas would at least cover the costs of the film that we buy, so there's no loss for you. And all the other cinemas we supply, that's again money for jam. And so the business built up. And in the end, we had a circuit of 350 cinemas with over 2,000 films which I've imported from all around the world. In those days, too, I used to travel a lot, twice a year, to England, Europe, and America, buying, negotiating. So we built up a big empire. What? Determination, perseverance, hard work. I used to work 20 hours a day. For years and years and years. I suppose that is what affected the heart and all the other things. Nevertheless, that's beside the point. But what I'm trying to tell you, that you can achieve whatever you want to achieve, and I'm talking to you of my personal life, that you enjoy the greatest prestige in society, and that you had been very well off until my partner thought I was going to die. Even I had the open heart operation, and they start fiddling the books, and then TV came in, and the film business, cinema business went down, and of course, my shares that were worth over two million, you know, it was all lost. And I, as a guru, can't go and sue them. It sounds very bad. A guru suing film company. Great. And then I chose this life. And although I don't have money, I have the inner spiritual force and wisdom 
and happiness and joy, which is worth far, far more than millions and millions and millions of puns. Do you get the point about the pun? Do you see? So when you apply for a job, if you're going for a job, and your job is for next week, what's today? Tuesday? Tuesday today? You know, when you're out and around, you forget the days and the dates and, you know, you do. I think it's Tuesday today, isn't it? But, and so, say for example, if you have an appointment for next Tuesday for a job. This week you go, you do your spiritual practices regularly and get that confidence with the help of Guru Shakti. And you go and apply for the job and you are going to get it. Now, don't go and apply for an executive's job dressed in jeans. Dress accordingly and dress decently when you're going to apply for a job because the first impression the boss gets is your appearance. And dress decently and be polite and have that confidence. And think in your heart, my guru is standing next to me. He's standing by me. And nothing can go wrong. And if you feel that sincerely within your heart, nothing will go wrong. That's a secret. And also, who's the guru? He's only an instrument through whom these divine energies flow. So, I saw in Bhavna's bedroom, which she gave over to me, that little polar bear with that beautiful saying, but how does it go again? There's nothing um, that I want to do today. No, there's nothing that I want to do today that you and me can do together. Beautiful. Let's repeat that. Yes, no, you, you, I'll repeat after you. Sir. Help me to remember, Lord, hmm, that there is nothing I want to do today Together. That you and me cannot handle together. See how beautiful. So if you have that faith and trust within yourself, that confidence within yourself, and confidence just not just drop in your lap, you've got to make some effort. And spiritual practices, believe you me, believe you me. I ran away from home when I was four and a half years old in search of God. And, and from that time, the power and the self-realization has been growing and growing and growing in me until I could say from many, many years ago that I and my Father are one. I and God are of the same substance. But nothing can go wrong. So have that determination. Understand that. Have that knowledge that nothing can go wrong. Your Guru is standing at your side. And when you have that confidence, the interviewer feels it. Because you emanate, I said sometimes somewhere, you emanate a certain energy from you which the other person feels. Look here in this room, for example, or in any of the other satsangs, and there are many of you here that have attended Practically every satsang I've held in England, you know, and elsewhere. And they will tell you that when they are with me in the presence where I am, they feel such peace. And I'm not giving that peace consciously, but it is just emanating from me because I am at peace inside. So naturally they get affected. If you touch wet paint, naturally you'll get the paint on your fingers. Be in the company of holy people, have the thoughts always on the optimistic side. Even if you are hungry, starving today, do not be pessimistic. Remember the old saying, for this too will pass. Nothing remains forever. For this too will pass. I was a millionaire, and today I haven't got a penny. That doesn't bother me. So all this must pass. And even if I have the millions and should die of heart attack tomorrow, am I going to take it with me? No, you don't. 
But nobody denies you a comfortable living. And the Bible says, even a laborer is entitled to his labor. And that's how the world runs. Because the entire world is based today in today's world. Everything is based on economics. All the countries in the world that war against each other, that fight, and if you go deep into the background, it's all based on economics. The lust for power and greed. But we do not need to be that. So those of you who have read some of your forms that are without jobs and don't know what to do, apply, apply, apply to more and more. You never know, something can just turn up. It will. It must. It's an inevitable law. But become deserving and then demand. And you'll find it just all works out beautifully. Nine o'clock. You can't get away without having a few laughs. So this one man went to a Kerry restaurant. And so a Kerry waiter comes up to him. So says, uh, will you give me some asparagus? So the Kerry waiter says, we don't serve sparrows here, but by the way, how do you know my name is Gus? <laughs> so here in this other Kerry village, here in this other Kerry village, there is a church tower, like all villages have. And there were two clocks on the church tower. So this visitor noticed that both clocks were not giving the same time. The one said half past two and the other said half past three. Something like that. So the visitor asked, but how come the two clocks on your tower don't give the same time? And so this fellow replies, that look, if they gave the same time, then we would not need two clocks. <laughs> you know, you've heard of uh, Charles Atlas. You know, you write in bodybuilding. All right. So this one Kerry man writes into Charles Atlas for his course. All right. So he gets his course and uh, afterwards he writes to Charles Atlas. He says, Dear Sir, I finished your course, now will you please send me the muscles? <laughs> <laughs> so there's one other guy, another kitty man, you know? He was brought up in front of the judge. So the judge asks him, Were you up here before me? So the scary man replies, so I wouldn't know because I don't know at what time you get up. So then the judge explained that what I mean is uh, it's the first time that you are in court. So here the crowd in the court was laughing away. So the judge, you know, bangs his hammer. He says, order, order. So this fellow in the dock says, give me a pint. <laughs> <laughs> now this couple went for a picnic and they parked the car and took a few miles walk into the woods. So the wife asked, the Kerry woman asked the Kerry man, the wife asked the man, did you put the car keys away safely? So he replies, yes I did, I locked it up in the boot. <laughs> <laughs> So now there was an ad in the paper, and they were, uh, you know, an ad by the the Dublin Symphony Orchestra. So I said, this one man applies for the job, the scary man. And they asked the scary man, can you play the violin? So he says, I don't know, sir, I've never tried it. <laughs> you know, one thing is very funny, the scary man was thinking, 
he says the thermos flask. You know the thermos flask, eh? Is that what you call it here? Thermos flask. He says, what a wonderful invention. If you put in tea in there, it keeps it hot. And if you put cold, chilled, orange juice in there, it keeps it cold. Now, how does the thermos flask know? <laughs> and so this one Kerryman stole a car. Then he was arrested and brought to trial. The prosecutor cross-questioned him. He says, yes, I took the car. It was parked outside a cemetery. I thought the man was dead, so I took the car. <laughs> oh, there's plenty more. Save some for tomorrow. I believe Dublin's are fond of Kerry jokes. Is Kerry a place somewhere or somewhere? Oh, down south. I see. Is it near Cork? Oh, is that where they make uh, the corks for the wine bottles? <laughs> <laughs> In the early evening, Ted uh, had a tea room up there, and he got some videos from previous satsangs, but maybe it was probably Ted. Yeah. So, if any of you I mean, would like to you know, watch them, you must watch them. Oh, very well. Very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.